you're here before school starts, so that's, that's great. Um, so it's, I'm um, very happy to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Robin Brewer. Um, so Robin is a system professor in the School of Information and also here at the Computer Science and Engineering. And uh, her work is, is at the intersection of uh, HCI, accessibility, and uh, social computing. Um, and he received, she received her PhD in, from Northwestern um, in computer science and uh, social uh, and communication studies. So, uh, so we're very happy to um, have Robin here to talk to us about applications of AI for accessibility. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you all for inviting me to speak. I'm just down on Central Campus, but I try to come up here as much as, as possible. I have a, an appointment here in Computer Science and Engineering as well. Um, and as was mentioned, my background is at the intersection of computer science and more social sciences. So I was in a, a joint PhD program at Northwestern. Um, today I'm going to be talking about my research as it relates to um, AI. I'm primarily an HCI and accessibility researcher. I like to draw this little Venn diagram to talk about how my research fits together in different ways. Um, but um, from my research, it focuses primarily on older adults and people with vision impairments um, and, and different emerging technologies as it relates to those communities. I've been thinking a lot more about AI and the implication of AI, um, particularly for uh, groups of people with disabilities or older adults. So I want to start off um, with a couple of concepts that guide my work that will be important to understand before we get started. And that is, uh, one is that disability is socially constructed, is how I think about disability. And so you might be wondering, you know, what does that mean? Um, I think about the social model of disability rather than the medical model of disability. So if you think about the medical model of disability, it's about um, impairment focus and how can we fix impairments and normalize um, disability in some way, whereas the social model of disability is about this. So people are not disabled by their impairments, rather um, they are by the barriers that they face, the barriers that they face and the barriers that are created by society. So it's more thinking about the societal uh, implications of how we create our environments and how that may or may not support uh, people with disabilities. So that's the first one, disability as uh, socially constructed. And then the second that guides my research is disability as a spectrum. So oftentimes it's not necessarily binary, yes or no, someone has a disability, or yes or no, someone has a vision impairment, but it's about a spectrum. Um, so if you think of um, maybe the easiest to think about is uh, vision impairment. Um, if you think about an eye chart, there, there are different levels of visual acuity. People can be on a range of visual acuity. Um, for the type of research that I do, I mentioned I do work around people with vision impairments. I think about um, people who are blind, and blind can mean uh, blind with light perception or not light perception, um, or people with low vision, that part of the vision spectrum, right? And so um, you can also think about people who have multiple disabilities and not just one disability. So I think about this in terms of levels. Um, and I talk about this now because it frames a lot of um, how I think about disability in AI, um, particularly as uh, disability can be difficult to frame when you think about norms and what is average and what is expected, um, just because it may be difficult to model certain types of things. So that's just a hint of what I'll be uh, talking about um, a little bit later, but um, what I want to do today is spend some time talking about my research in two different context. Uh, one is around uh, AI in the context of autonomous vehicles, and the second is around AI in the context of voice assistants. So first, I'm going to talk about autonomous vehicles and people with vision impairments, may, which may sound a bit odd to put together. Um, like I said, I'm thinking about people who are blind or uh, low vision when I talk about vision impairment. 
And my main argument here is that we need AI models that understand uh, the nuances of disability. So uh, at a higher level, if you zoom out and talk about uh, transportation and disability more broadly, this is a quote from the president of the National Federation of the Blind, or NFB. And this quote says, with proper training and opportunity, the blind can compete on compete on terms of equality with the sighted in any aspect of life except for driving a car, of course. Right? So you get your license taken away or may not be issued a license if you cannot see the road, which makes sense, right? Um, but this also impacts people's um, uh, independence in a sense and their ability to get from place to place, their ability to access different resources where you might need transportation to do so. So one of the um, initiatives of the NFB in the past, I want to say 10 or 15 years, is to understand how to support uh, accessible transportation or better transportation, particularly for people who are blind. And so there's been a lot of uh, research and work around supporting accessible navigation and transportation. Um, there's been a lot in the HCI, human computer interaction context, and in other contexts as well, and disability studies. Um, and then there's been a lot of more tangible things, especially uh, recently around supporting uh, people with disabilities in transportation. Uh, on the left here, we have uh, an image of an orientation and mobility or O&M specialist um, who is a licensed uh, specialist who trains people who are blind or low vision to use assistive technology such as a white cane, which you see here, or how to navigate around with a guide dog, usually through walking. So this is more uh, work around accessible navigation. Uh, there's been work around accessible transportation. So you might think about paratransit services or accessible public transportation options. There are also more uh, private transportation options, such as this vehicle here, which is a wheelchair accessible Honda Odyssey with a ramp where you can roll into the vehicle. Um, and then there's more um, recent work out of IRA. Um, is any, raise your hand if you're familiar with IRA. Okay, one person familiar with Ira. Um, Ira is a company that has these augmented reality headsets uh, that can support people primarily with vision impairments is how they advertise it and navigating uh, their environments while walking or when they get out of a vehicle. So there's this last mile problem where once someone gets out of a vehicle, they might not necessarily be at their final destination. You might have to find a very specific door or in this case in the image, this is like a coffee shop and the person needs to zoom into the menu or they might need to find out where the counter is. And these augmented reality headsets connect uh, people with vision impairments to a live agent who can help them uh, navigate their environment. So there's been some work around uh, accessible navigation and transportation in a lot of different contexts, including um, a lot of research here uh, at Michigan around indoor navigation, uh, thinking about robotics and autonomous vehicles, which um, I will talk a little bit more about. Uh, but in the context of autonomous vehicles, as you say, I'll, I'll be mentioning autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars, automated vehicles kind of interchangeably today. There are some nuances there. Um, but thinking about autonomous vehicles and more of these independent modes of transportation where people don't have to rely on someone else, there's been this great promise of well, these vehicles are going to be able to support people who cannot currently drive. So you think about kids, you might think about um, people who have difficulty accessing public transportation, such as people in rural areas. But also there's been this big promise of self-driving cars for um, people with disabilities, specifically uh, people who are blind or low vision. And so there was work almost, I guess, almost a decade ago now around uh, prototypes that companies and organizations were developing. One on the left here is Google's self-driving car prototype back in 2012. And they advertised it as though this were something that were going to be on the market soon. They had uh, a guy go on a Taco Bell run with a burrito or 
something, I don't eat a lot of Taco Bell, but something in his hand and to say that someone with a vision impairment one day could um, independently, independently navigate in a self-driving car. And then here, the bottom right is uh, a vehicle that was created out of the Blind Driver Challenge that, again, the National Federation of the Blind um, initiated back in 2011. They partnered with Virginia Tech to create uh, an SUV that could go around a racetrack uh, independently. And they had the president, this is the president of the National Federation of the Blind who was in that vehicle navigating um, that vehicle. And there hasn't really been too much work that um, we've seen outside of these prototypes until uh, this past year, uh, Lyft, Active, and the National Federation Blind partnered together to provide rides to blind and low vision passengers at um, the NFB annual convention. Right, so there, there shows potential, but it's still not something that is commonplace. These vehicles are not on the roads. There are a lot of policy implications for that, but there's also not a lot of research to understand um, how people with vision impairments want to interact in an autonomous vehicle, what they see some of their barriers are, and what some of their needs are. So that started out um, this, this first project around that very thing around autonomy. Um, and it's important to understand the different, the, the spectrum of autonomy. So there are six different stages of autonomy by SAE. And it goes from no automation at all, all the way up to full automation. And so what I wanted to understand was what are um, people with vision impairments preferences and um, the perceptions of these different levels of autonomy, and then how can we design something around that? So I, I um, had some funding through the Center for Connected and Automated Transportation here on campus, which funds a lot of uh, research related to um, not just autonomous vehicles, but other forms of transportation. It's one of the uh, Department of Transportation funded uh, research centers. I partnered with them and I partnered with the Greater Detroit Agency for the Blind and Visually Impaired uh, to run a couple of different focus groups with people with vision impairments, both blind and low vision, um, to understand their perceptions of fully autonom uh, autonomous vehicles and semi-autonomous vehicles, and then to understand some potential design solutions to any of the barriers that they had identified during the focus groups. Um, so you can see at the top, uh, there is a man and a woman who are part of the focus groups. And I should mention that these were focus groups, so they weren't just, uh, these were design-based focus groups, so they weren't just verbal, but they were also uh, tangible and that uh, people were asked to design and make things. Um, and so you can see almost what he has made, which is at the bottom. Um, and can anyone tell what this image here at the bottom is? It's a pipe cleaner and a, like a piece of clay together. Can, can you guess what this might be trying to mimic? Brakes. Say that again? Brakes. Brakes? No, not exactly. In this case, um, it was trying, so brakes would be natural to think about like on a car, for example, but this was um, designed to mimic a white cane that someone who's blind or uh, has low vision might use to navigate uh, obstacles in their environment. So you can kind of see it, not in the extended form, but in its folded up form there, and the woman there has one. Um, it's a, a white cane that unfolds and people can tap the ground to understand where obstacles are. Uh, people had designed, a group of uh, people had designed uh, almost like a white cane for a car so that they could understand uh, what are the obstacles that the car is interacting with if they're unable to see them in an autonomous vehicle. Right? And so we had found that people had these different perceptions around what an autonomous vehicle should be able to do or not be able to do, but they also have um, thoughts around what they should be able to do in an autonomous vehicle. And thoughts particularly differed around um, when they lost their vision. So for people who had acquired vision loss, so they had lost vision at some point in their life, they, they were able to see at one point and then they lost uh, their vision or whether it was sudden or gradual, uh, they preferred more of the semi 
autonomous vehicles, whereas those who had congenital vision loss, meaning that they were blind either from birth or near birth, uh, they preferred more the, the fully autonomous vehicles. They had never driven before. They said, like, I completely trust these vehicles, whereas those who had some driving experience did have some um, concerns around trusting, well, if the, the car is going right, how can I trust that it's going right, right? So there are these differences around um, how people wanted to interact in an autonomous vehicle, even though we might all classify the participants as people with vision impairments or even people who were blind, but there were differences within those groups. So what are the implications of this for the AI community? Right. So one is that we need autonomous vehicles models that understand uh, the nuances of disability. So um, not only modeling the vision impairment spectrum to say we need something to understand blind versus low vision or uh, sighted low vision blind, but also when people uh, were diagnosed with that particular impairment might affect things around like trust in using something. And, um, the, the type of vehicle that they would want to be in. But then also thinking about trust over time, right? So thinking about robotics literature and how people trust robots or not trust robots, thinking about models that can adapt to people's comfort levels and trust over time, especially in the, in the vehicle context. Okay, so I'm going to um, transition from this example, this context, autonomous vehicles, to a different project that is around uh, voice assistance, conversational voice assistance, but I did want to pause and see if there were any questions that people had. Yes. Uh, would you please go back one slide? Mm -hmm. uh, so you said that people who lost their vision, uh, vision later in life preferred, I don't know, the conditional automation. And it says that they have to be ready to take control of the vehicle. So how does that work? Exactly. And so um, this is what we're in the next phases of trying to figure out what would the design of such a vehicle look like? Would it be something where they interact through voice interaction, voice input? Um, would it be more tangible where or tactile? Um, where people can understand what is happening in an environment and take some type of action. Um, so it, right now it seems impossible, right? Someone who cannot see, how can they dictate what is happening in a vehicle? And I think we're still a ways off from this um, taking place, particularly around the, the policy implications of this. Um, but thinking about, say, maybe 10 years from now, this could be something where we could have these multimodal um, interfaces in a vehicle that would allow someone um, to be accurate in the control that they take, even if they cannot see the environment around them. Okay. Yes. Uh, are there currently any sort of machinery that can be operated by someone with low vision that, like, for forms of navigation or manipulation or something? Yeah, so there are a number of different um, navigation apps that are used by people with low vision and same for people who are blind and a lot of that relies on audio there's also so there's there's differences between low vision and blind um, there's work that shows that people with low vision prefer to use their vision as much as possible so they will take advantage more of the magnification as much as they can as opposed to solely relying on voice but when that um, doesn't work out as well, then they usually will switch to voice. And then for people who are blind, they will prefer, um, increasingly now they're preferring more voice-based technologies. In the past, it was more tactile, especially when Braille was taught more um, and there were more schools for the blind. Um, but now it's, it's shifting a little bit more towards voice-based. Question. Any other questions before I move to the next context? Yes. What's the percentage look like? Uh, you mentioned like if, if people lost their sight after they they're born, uh, they prefer the what automation, right? Mm -hmm. But, but how is like the percentage look like? So you want to know the frequency of that happening of people who had congenital vision loss? Yeah. Um. So I have to go back to the paper to see the exact percentage. Okay. Um. But I would say for the people who did have congenital vision loss, it was 
near 80% who had preferred the, the fully autonomous vehicle. So it was a majority of the, the people who were in the focus groups for each of those um, conditions, diagnoses. Cool. Um, so now I'm going to move on to another context in my work where I think about AI a lot, and that is in the context of conversational voice assistance, which I'll, I'll describe a little bit more what I mean by that. Um, but I think about that in the context of older adults using these. And when I say older adults, I mean people over the age of 60, 60, 65, usually, and these are uh, age ranges that are um, determined by the World Health Organization. They used to be 65, and now they moved down to 60. And then thinking about like Pew Research, Pew Internet Research, and the, the surveys that they do, they typically use 65 and up as their cutoff. So there are these standards around ages for older adults. Sometimes, not maybe not as much in this crowd, but I might get pushed back with people saying, well, I'm 65, and I'm not an older adult. But uh, these are not age cutoffs determined by me. Um, and my <laughs> argument here is that we need uh, AI models to understand aging. And so my first argument was understanding disability, and here's understanding aging. And I just want to point out that aging and disability are different components of accessibility. So someone can be an older adult with a disability, but not necessarily the case. So here I'm talking about the context of aging and all of the nuances that come with that and um, these different life transitions, societal transitions, role transitions. Um, and so I want to start off with maybe the OG of uh, conversational agents, and that is Eliza. So raise your hand if you've heard of Eliza. Okay, about six or seven people here. Um, so Eliza was one of the very first chatbots that could actually fool people into thinking that it was a, a human. Um, and it had a number of different programs. Uh, one that I think is maybe one of the most popular is the doctor program where it was mimicking a psychotherapist. And this was a program that was created in the 1960s, right? So before a lot of the, um, I guess, the Google assistants of today, this was something in the 1960s. It, it wasn't the most intelligent in that it didn't recognize patterns and adapt space on that, but it did have a script with a lot of Q&A options, almost like a big conditional statement program. And so it's, it's hard to see here, but there is a user who is talking about their boyfriend, and Eliza is trying to understand, why well, are you depressed, and why are you depressed? Can you explain what made you unhappy? Um, so there's this back and forth uh, conversation there. So we fast forward to today, there are a number of uh, conversational AI tools for well-being. Uh, they focus a lot on mental health or prevention of the negative behavior. So thinking about the context of mental health, there's lots of virtual therapists and virtual chatbots. Uh, the image here is a screenshot here. It's about an article about a virtual uh, therapist that helps veterans open up about post-traumatic stress disorder. And then on uh, the right here, there is an article, School Surveillance Internet Hopes to Decrease Suicide Shootings by Understanding How People Are Talking Online, Leveraging uh, the Conversation That Exists Online. So there's conversational tools for well-being, there's conversa conversational tools for general information seeking, uh, so facts, when did a particular person die, uh, what countries start with the letter O? Fun fact, there's only one country that starts with the letter O. I'm going to let you all try to think about which country that is. Um, there are conversational tools for entertainment, so whether that's playing music, that's asking Alexa to tell a joke, asking a tool, like a smart speaker conversational tool, to uh, respond in a particular person's voice, Samuel L. Jackson's voice. Um, and then there are AI tools for different types of tasks, so whether that's something as simple as setting an alarm for something or creating a reminder for something um, or turning on a light or some sort of appliance. What we're seeing is that there's a trend as these voice interfaces are becoming more and more ubiquitous um, that we can use them in all sorts of conversational contexts. And so what I was interested in is how might we leverage voice interfaces, broadly speaking, maybe not something as specific as this smart speaker, but how can we leverage voice interfaces um, for older adults? 
And so the question might be, well, why do we care about voice interfaces for older adults and for these aging communities? Um, and it was motivated by a lot of formative work that I did with observations and interviews with older adults and older adults with um, late life vision loss, where they were essentially describing how uh, late life disability as something that could affect their computer use. Uh, so they had challenges learning how to use um, a computer with an assistive technology such as a screen reader. There were too many uh, shortcuts to remember. It was too complicated to set up the screen reader. Um, they might have diff difficulty getting to a computer. So one of the places one of the communities where I did observations was an independent and assisted living community in Chicago, or right outside of Chicago, and they had a computer room in a basement. Right? A lot of times computers are in basements, but people might have a wheelchair and it might be difficult to get there, or if they're sick, they might not be able to get down to the computer room, even though this was something in a community that they were already living in. Um, difficulty with passwords and the cognitive load of and burden of remembering tons and tons of passwords. Also in the observations, I saw how uh, people would forget their password, and then they would forget the password to the backup email address, and then the backup. And then at some point, um, I don't know if they still do this, but Gmail, if you forget your password, you have to go through this weird survey of when did you first create a Gmail account? <laughs> when did you first use Google Drive? And so this was just, people ended up creating new email accounts, essentially. <laughs> um, and then there's also this preference for voice-based communication. So from observations and from interviews, learning how people often rely on their phones for communication. And oftentimes these weren't smartphones. Um, they were landline phones or they were non-smart or feature phones. Uh, if you think of um, like phones without internet access, uh, no color on the screen, right? These were basic phones that could make and receive phone calls. And they relied on these a lot for communication um, because they liked the idea of connecting with, to someone else through voice. They found this to be more social. They found this, this to be less isolating. This is really important because there's a higher risk of loneliness and social isolation, particularly um, among the older adult uh, demographic. So um, because of this, I, I wanted to think about, OK, well, what would it mean to create a voice-based uh, online community for older adults? And so um, what I did is I wanted to understand, OK, well, how are older adults currently engaging online, and what do they value in online communities? So I did interviews with 20 active older adult bloggers. When I say active, I mean like very active. They blog every day. They schedule blog posts. They plan time in their schedules to draft and research facts for their blog posts. So this was something almost like people compared it to a job, even though they were retired. Um, and from that, they talked about how blogging can fill a void for social interaction, and blogging helped them learn from others. Um, and one way that they learned from others is looking at other people's blog posts, commenting on them. People would comment back. Here is a screenshot from one of the older adult bloggers. Uh, she dubs herself the, the mother of the elder bloggers. Um, and this is, this is one of our recent uh, post lists from maybe last week or so, or this week. Uh, where she specifically talks about aging-related uh, topics on her blog. So, for example, crabby old lady cuts loose, or elder music, Maya Angelou on aging. So there were a lot of topics that were specific to aging, which is what people um, value. But they wanted to essentially learn from others and have some form of social interaction. So what I ended up doing was I developed a, a, essentially a voice-based blogging community uh, using an IVR interactive voice response approach where uh, someone could dial in and interact through keypad input to listen to other people's blog posts or comments, listen to their own blog posts or comments, or um, record a new blog post. So I won't spend too much time in the, the workflow, how the system works, uh, but happy to answer questions on that. Um, at the end, uh, but I deployed the system of Scott Express for 10 weeks with older adults with late life vision loss. And similarly, I found a theme of 
people wanted to learn, wanted to use the system to learn about disability. Uh, they found it uh, as a tool to alleviate the stigma and challenges of connecting in person. So uh, from this work, I started to learn, okay, well, voice interfaces, particularly for older adults, are uh, helpful in reducing stigma and learning about something new. And so how can we translate that to um, other contexts? And particularly, if you think about learning, if you think about stigma, one context that both of those are uh, prevalent in is in a health context. So um, as a, a next, uh, I guess, a current phase of my research is understanding conversational voice assistance uh, for health. So transitioning from thinking about landline phones to thinking about something that is, might be more pervasive going forward, and, and that is Again, these smart assistants, these smart conversational assistants. So why should we think about this for health? Well, um, there's been a lot of uh, work, particularly in the public health community, around a shortage of medical professionals, especially as a lot of the global population starts to age more. Um, there's this 24-7 availability. If you have internet access, you can contact whenever, uh, contact, um, not contact, but you can connect whenever you like to a conversational voice assistant. AI already does well at recognizing patterns and, and symptoms, and it can be less stigmatizing um, and more empowering than something that is in person. Okay, so uh, voice assistants for health are already here. Um, last year, yes, last year, April 2019, Amazon launched their first HIPAA compliant uh, skills. And there are other skills and actions with the Google Assistant, such as diagnosing symptoms, getting information about food, finding health providers, tracking or filling medication pres prescriptions. So it's already here. These are three of the apps, three of the six um, Amazon Alexa apps that were announced in April. So one is asking for a daily tip, finding the nearest urgent care, and asking for a last blood sugar meeting. Right. So it, it's starting to become more and more um, of a thing, more pervasive. But it can be dangerous if we do not study the use in context. So this is a, a table from, um, a chart from uh, of Big Moore's uh, article back in 2018, where they were comparing uh, Siri, they were comparing Google Assistant, they were comparing Alexa, and seeing how people ask, uh, health-related questions to each of these devices, and then they ask a medical professional to evaluate the transcripts and see what is the worst possible, worst case scenario, what can happen um, if people actually follow through with this advice. Uh, so in many cases, on the left, you see task failure was one of the options that could happen. The other, um, is potential harm to the person. And then last is potential death, right? So following some of this advice could have um, dire consequences for those who uh, trust the information enough to then be able to follow that information. So what I wanted to do is to understand, particularly around uh, older adults who might ask these questions, and there's a lot of research that shows that older adults may trust information online a bit more um, than younger adults, what, how are they thinking about searching with these uh, voice assistants, particularly around health information seeking? So um, a team of about four of us had interviewed 35 older adults um, around their health information seeking practices. We gave them two scenarios where we uh, asked them something very general first and then something more specific around a few different health-related topics. We asked them what would, how would they interact with the voice assistant? What would they expect to happen? Then we asked them to actually make that query to the voice assistant and then tell us how it aligned or did not align to their expectations. Um, and so we're still in the process of analyzing some of this data, but what we're starting to see is that people valued an iterative search process and they also valued conversation. They expected uh, some form of conversation, which oftentimes did not happen. Uh, so one person said, if we started a dialogue, they expected that it sort of began to zero in. So far, this doesn't lead to conversation. So this did not align to their expectation. 
And then also they expected the voice assistant to be customized to older adults. Uh, so one person said, I think the older you are, the more serious it is when you get ill. It is recommended that you go and see a health professional in any case. So they expected these voice assistants to know something about them and particularly in a health context, be able to recommend an age-related um, action to go and take. So what does it mean to have age-specific conversational assistance? Um, how can we think beyond kids? Right now, a lot of these voice assistants have parental controls um, so that kids aren't asking wacky questions and getting <laughs> answers if the adult does not want them to do so. Um, but thinking beyond kids, how can we think about, OK, this is what something might look like, how it might be modeled for a younger adult, middle age, older adult, and how can we think about designing conversational systems that can adapt throughout one's lifespan. So you can think about kids right now have little cousins that they love interacting with Alexa. Well, how will that interaction change as they start to age? And so older adults may uh, interact more conversationally. They may expect certain queries to result in human interactions. So for example, that always call the doctor example. They may also seek more social interaction if they um, could be at risk for loneliness or, or social isolation. And some of the other tasks, like information seeking, entertainment, or these task-related queries. Uh, so uh, that leads to uh, kind of uh, another project that I'm working on now around conversational assistance, and this is, okay, let's see if I can, because I like the video. Okay, um, so this is a partnership with uh, SoundMind, and SoundMind is an organization out of New York. They've created this um, Alexa skill that helps older adults who live in independent and assisted living communities uh, to learn more about their care plans, whether that's nutrition or whether that's what their last reading was or a particular medical device or when their next appointment is. I mean, they gave uh, these echoes to any older adult across two communities who wanted one. Um, they're interested in how they're using this app, but they say, okay, well, we know they're using this, this, uh, this Alexa for things beyond our app. So you can study whatever that is, whatever you want that to be. Um, and so uh, a team of folks, including Tofik, who is in the audience, um, it, we're studying how people would use uh, a voice assistant, how older adults use voice assistants for uh, social and emotional well-being. So let me get that to think about navigating. So uh, how do older adults use voice assistance for social and emotional well-being? Um, we did not know how to answer this question. There, there isn't a lot of uh, work out there, data sets available of how older adults use uh, voice assistance. Um, but in general, lack of representation around older adults and people with disabilities is a major problem when we think about um, AI and um, that means lack of representation in the models and the data sets themselves. And this could mean that disability and aging are essentially treated as outliers in whatever model we're training. And that is, means that we need more data, right? And so there are organizations that are um, kind of trying to address this call for more data in a number of different contexts. So there's Common Voice out of Mozilla. It's their initiative to help teach machines, how real people speak. And so you can go, you can click on the microphone, you can donate your voice, speak like five different statements, or you can help validate voices and listen to voices. Um, however, right now, you can only, uh, if you go to download this data set, you will only know about age, gender, and language, right? So we have no information about uh, ability. Um, and this could lead to things if you don't know, if you don't have that representation around disability and aging, uh, this could lead to uh, some consequences such as this article says for some employment algorithms, disability discrimination by default. So we want to also think about how we can incorporate disability into our data sets and into our models. Um, I won't play this video now, but 
uh, go and look at uh, Project Euphonia out of Google. They also recently have Project Understood, and this is meant to help to train their models on how people with disabilities speak to these different um, conversational tools and how, could, how they could adjust their models so that they can understand um, when people with disabilities are speaking. Right, so uh, with SoundLine, thankfully, they gave us all of their data from the last two years. Uh, and we have 643,000 commands uh, that people um, made to the, in this case, it's an Alexa, although Google Home is on the uh, slide. And people could enroll at any time. So we have some people who may have started at the very beginning a couple years ago um, and are still using the Alexa. We might have some people who started, say, like, in July, um, and we're analyzing their commands. And so what um, our team did and told people that this is to build a classifier to classify whether something relates to social and emotional well-being or not, essentially that binary uh, classification, yes, this does relate, or no, this does not. And now what we want to do is to be able to um, break that down into to categories. So we have a list of categories, about 10 categories in our codebook. Um, that we're trying to essentially build a classifier to identify, yes, this belongs in these specific categories, or no, it's not. And so some of the categories are um, in direct health admissions or direct health admissions. And some examples of that are Alexa, are you my mother? Or I'm a kid, I'm mentally and emotionally, I am much younger than my chronological age. So this could hint at something such as a cognitive impairment or some form of mild cognitive impairment. Uh, there's a desire to be social. So good morning, how are you today, Alexa? Tell me a story. Uh, there was one query where someone asked Alexa, did they have Thanksgiving plans? So this could be the person is expecting an interaction from uh, the computer itself, from Alexa. And in other cases, it's using the Alexa for uh, human-related interactions. So they might be asking to call such and such or text someone else, let someone else know how I am doing. Uh, and another example is, or another category is relaxing sounds. So could you play some relaxation music or invoking some type of meditation uh, skill? Um, and so we're still in the process of categorizing this information, but there, between the, the conversational voice assistant project and the um, autonomous vehicle project, there are a couple of takeaways that I just wanted to highlight around um, AI and accessibility. So one is that, uh, think about this as a spectrum. So disability and aging should be thought of as a spectrum. Uh, the challenge is that it can be difficult to rec uh, represent something on such a wide spectrum with, as a meaningful feature. And then especially in the context of aging, but also in the context of disability, how might this model change over time, especially as someone's age changes over time, especially if disability can get more progressive over time, um, and what does that mean? And then also that there's a lack of representation in existing models and data sets, and we need to create more data. We also need to understand what is happening in that data, which is what we're trying to do with that uh, sound line data of 600,000 plus uh, commands. And so there are other researchers that are thinking about AI and accessibility. Um, there's the AI Now Institute that uh, late last year, November 2019, uh, they published a full report on disability in AI. So uh, I think that's on Medium. So if you are interested in learning more about that or reading the full report, I recommend I'm going to go and do that. And if you're interested, say, in collaborating with those 600,000 plus queries that we have, uh, let me know. We have data from November 2017 up through July 2019 for now. And so if there are lots of things that we are not currently looking at but we're interested in, and that could be things around emotion, the temporal nature of the queries, it could be the error recognition recovery from the query. So let me know um, if you are interested. And with that, I would like to take questions. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking about um, the social interactions with the agent, right? So the one that caught me was, oh, do you have Thanksgiving plans? That's a very 
weird line to cross because you do you don't want wrong expectations right? because in the end it's an agent so i know you're still at the initial stages of your work but how do you think you would manage such expectations of being social but recognizing it's an <coughs> agent well that's a good question so um it reminds me of some of the work that i've done on dementia and interacting with older adults with dementia so one i, I had volunteered for an, an art therapy program uh, people with dementia and one of the number one rules in training was to um, always go along with the narrative that the person with dementia has so for example if someone was talking about their mother you wouldn't necessarily tell them, oh, your mother has been dead for 40 years, but you would say, oh, you know, tell me more about that or continue this narrative, right? So it depends on how we want to think about these assistants. Are we thinking about them as an exact representation of reality? Um, or are we thinking about them as something else, something, for example, that can be a companion to someone who might be socially isolated? So we're trying to explore that. We're, first, we're, we're trying to see how people are already trying to do this. So that Thanksgiving example was a surprise to me. Um, but there are cases where you can do this with these conversational assistants now, where you can ask, how are you doing, and they will respond. Um, so part of it is like trying to understand how we want to think about these things. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think there's a huge space that a lot of uh, really interesting work can be done in this space. Um, just have a quick, quick question about this voice-based interface. Um, so, like for the speech recognition, right? So, although you know we have seen like huge improvement in speech recognition, uh, particularly for children and for uh, for aging like uh, elderly, like the recognition rates probably can be very challenging. So I'm just wondering, you know, what do you have? Uh, you know, what is the? Because I'm not really keep up with this. So what is the the number? <laughs> I mean, if we talk about like the speech recognition for elderly, what is the? That's uh, a good question. Like, what are the speech recognition rates? Yeah, I'm not or, exactly. Or the, I'm not exactly sure of the speech recognition rates for older adults. There are also challenges, for example, people with speech impairments or mm -hmm. cognitive impairments. So that project Euphonia, um, if you look at Project Euphonia, it's an initiative out of Google, and, and they're trying to understand, um, no, not Project Euphonia, Project Understood. They're trying to understand how people with Down syndrome speak to the Google Assistant. Um, I don't think in the video they specify the rates that they have, um, but they do talk about, okay, this could be a challenge for someone also with a speech and cognitive impairment, and we need to adjust our models for that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm not sure about the exact rates. Yeah, I mean, rates not very important, but yes. I'm just saying, like, how applicable today, like, these type of assistance can be. Still um, very ap yeah. applicable. Mm -hmm. um, Older adults and speech patterns, and it might not just be older adults, but speech patterns can change, especially with, for example, the development of um, mild cognitive impairment um, or different types of memory impairments as well. Um, so yes, I think it, it is something that can affect people even within the aging context and people beyond the aging context. This, I don't know how one would quantify this. It's a poorly chosen question. But um, how, would, how should I think about variation in accents versus variation due to aging or due to impairment? Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, to me, it seems that there's enough variation in accent that even without having to deal with issues of aging or speech impediments, one would have, from a technical perspective, had to address the same problems. That's where I'm coming from, but I don't know how to ask this question well. There has been work in um, accents and languages and internationalization. There was one participant in the, the conversational out of the uh, study with 35 older adults who came in, and the very first thing they said is, I don't think it's going to understand me because I have an accent and my, I forget what device they have, but the one I have at home never understands me. Um, and so this was a, a challenge for this participant, but you can also, as you said, this is a challenge for other people as well, depending on the accent um, and the strength of the accent and these different vowel syllable patterns and um, 
it also goes back to thinking about what is the norm, right? Uh, I was talking about, okay, well, with disability, there really is no norm. With accents, there could also be a similar challenge of we're thinking about the norm as it relates to English, um, but there could be other types of norms and other ways to normalize uh, speech patterns that we need to look at as well. I think there was a question over here. Okay. Yes, um, which um, model um, did you guys use the classifier? Uh, Toby, you want to see, because we're in the process of tweaking things uh, for the classifier and iterating on it. So you said what model do you use for the class? Yeah, so uh, originally I used, we used um, uh, word embeddings, took the average for each one of the commands mm -hmm. to classify them, and we ended up, uh, the best model that we had was a random forest classifier. I, I see. Uh, but now uh, I'm changing it up a little bit, uh, going with uh, surprisingly much, much less, uh, you know, a complex one, just going with a bag of words model, and it, it performs a little better even. Uh, so yeah. Um, so I had a question about how people, so you said people use voice assist assistance because they were frustrated with you know, using computer or remembering details or something like that. So for these people for whom data is not accumulated, like the the accent example or people of aging, like have they been like we're not gonna use voice assistance because of these issues that I'm gonna go back to computers? Like was there any data that you came across along those lines? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, not that I've come across, actually there's been data, not that I've done, um, but uh, Walter Lasecki on one of his now former undergrad students, Raymond Dog had done around uh, voice assistants uh, that are being used by deaf and hard of hearing mm -hmm. communities. So you might think, okay, well, voice assistants are completely inaccessible to hard of hearing users, but on the contrast, um, they had some work that showed that people who are hard of hearing were trying to use these devices, but they weren't working, they were still trying to use them though. So there could be, um, you know, the there could be the initial motivation to want to use these devices, but even though it might seem like it might not be accessible or usable by certain communities. Um, but I could definitely see it as um, also, as you were mentioning, of people, okay, say, I'm not going to use these voice assistants, I'm going to use something else. There's also the option uh, to not have voice only voice assistants, but also like these multimodal voice assistants where uh, you can think about Siri or even. Uh, things that you can type to, voice assistants you can type to that could uh, respond back. In that sense, it wouldn't be a voice assistant, but it might be more of a conversational system where you can type and have a conversation, so it could still be accessible to um, communities who might not be speaking or might not have the output um, by voice or audio. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so one of the projects you mentioned uh, accessing sort of an audio block of sorts for people with no vision. So I'm curious in that space, when, when accessing like a block, people can just skim through things and look through a wide range of content, which wouldn't seem to be transferred very well to voice technology. So I'm curious how people have addressed that and how that sort of interaction with that. Yes. Yes. So browsing and also um, discoverability with a voice interface is a challenge. Um, so I had posted a, a, a workshop at a conference where we were talking about accessible voice interfaces and what are the main challenges and discoverability was one there where you don't know what you don't know. If you don't know how to discover new features, you don't know what you're not hearing. Um, you don't know how you can learn something new, um, but also browsing. So in the voice and express the voice-based blogging tool um, we have a feature where you could skip through blogs right so it'll play uh, a quick blurb of such and such posted a blog on this date at this time and it'll start to read the blog post at any time you could press a button to skip to the next post but it is in a similar order of a blog and then it is reverse chronological I meaning the, the most recent is first and then it goes down in history. Um, so that's how they currently browse. But we were also considering having things like uploading or downloading or having different forums, right? So you might have press one and you want to listen to content about 
um, animals or press two if you want to listen to content about sports so that it might be easier to discover different types of topics there. Um, so we, we see that as a, a potential and there, there are lots of posts and a lot of content in a voice-based system. So does it remain like serial inspection seems like the, the sole mechanism that people are able to interact with those uh, sort of technologies? Um, so the first question was it serial and then the second question is how do people interact with them? Yeah. So um, in that case, we haven't implemented it yet. We're still going through just this linear fashion of date-wise. Um, we were concerned with things like upvoting and downloading in terms of interaction because we could easily create a filter bubble where there are certain types of posts or certain people are bubbled up to the top and other people are at the bottom. And we didn't want to create that, particularly if we are um, doing some type of intervention or study with older adults who might already feel socially isolated and people aren't listening to what they have to say, which is why we chose more of the, the linear as opposed to being able to push more things to the top or not. Um, but in terms of interaction, people can uh, comment on the posts right now in terms of it. That's their primary form of interaction. They also get um, kind of a signal of what is happening with their post. So they not only get how many people have commented on their post, um, but also in this next iteration, they're um, going to get how many people have listened to their post as well. Because we observed in the, the first deployment that people would um, maybe listen and not leave a comment, but they still found the post valuable and the post interviews for the study, they would say, oh yeah, I listened to this person's post and that person's post, and I liked it for these reasons, but they wouldn't leave a comment. Um, so we're, we're experimenting now with um, the different forms of like statistics about uh, how people are interacting with the content. Almost similar to if you have a blog and you can see your, your reader statistics of, uh, or if you have Google Analytics on a website, you can see how many people have come to that site and looked at content and clicked on content. Yes. Um, so I'm curious about like how much you think the preferences of older adults are due to their age versus like the technology that they grew up with. Because I'd imagine like I don't think I like the voice blog interface, for example, like when I'm 65, um, and I can see like the space changing a lot over the next 20 years. That's a good question, right? So um, in terms of the space changing, I'm thinking now, okay, maybe this is something that doesn't always have to be uh, on a phone, right? But it could be something on some other type of voice interface. So what, if, what would this look like in the context of a voice assistant? Right. Um, in terms of the type of interaction, it's funny because, um, excuse me, similar questions uh, happen I would say every 50 years or so. Right. So if you have people who were using, who were avid radio users, you're like, there's no way I'm gonna uh, go to a telephone. And the telephone users, no way I'm gonna go to a computer. Computer users, no way I'm gonna go voice assistant. So there are certain patterns that repeat themselves. Um, but I, I feel like there is something unique in people valuing voice um, and the types of emotion that you can get from voice is something that we learn people, you can't really, well, you may or may not be able to detect uh, sarcasm or excitement from something that is text-based and so there's, there's something that still values voice. There's a reason why you know, phone communication has not completely gone away. Um, there's a reason now we're having a surge in things like podcasts, and voice is still prevalent. We still have radios. So I think there's something there about voice. I think the medium that we're using is going to shift, um, but uh, the value of voice-based communication is still going to be there. Yes? Um, back to the blog posts. Um, so like you said that you were thinking of including the number of people who also listened to the post. Um, would that be equivalent to the number of people who were who read the post? Because um, like for example, um, like in YouTube videos, um, the duration that someone watches a video shows um, their interest. So will you also take something like that into account? So you mean not only stating how many people have listened to the post, but how long they listen to it? Yes, because I'm thinking like in blog posts when 
if, if this is the post, then I, if I look at it, then I skim through it. If I'm interested, then I maybe think about it. Yeah. But if you just say that someone listened to it, then how, how do you know if they actually were interested? In it? Yeah, I think we'll have to have some threshold of what listening means. So as I said, you could listen to two seconds and skip to the next one. We don't necessarily want to count that as uh, listening to the post unless it was a two second post. Um, but I think that we would have to have some threshold to say that if, the, if someone has listened to say like at least half of the post. Right now, I don't know how valuable it would be for people to know that how long someone had listened to a post. Um, I think the value is just that people have listened to it and that there is someone out there listening because in the, the first uh, deployment of Express, people just weren't sure if there was anyone using the system or even dialing in. Um, and even if someone is listening for, say, like 15 seconds out of 60 seconds, that information is still valuable to the person who posted the content to say, all right, there is at least someone here who may or may not be interested, but I, I should keep posting. So what we found was that um, if there were no comments on a post, a person would say, oh, no one finds my information valuable, I'm going to stop posting. And we didn't want that to happen. We wanted to encourage um, production and participation. Uh, so even if someone is only listening to a part of a post, it, it could still serve to encourage someone to keep posting. Okay. Any more questions? So without any more questions, let's thank Robin again. Thank you.